Hi, and welcome to PostgreSQL through the eyes of an Oracle DBA. I'm Karen Jex, a senior database consultant with EDB. So I realized as I started to write this presentation and discuss the idea with people that actually it's more of a story than a, a real presentation. So are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Once upon a time, in the southeast of England, a young woman had just graduated with an MSc in software development. She didn't really know what she wanted to do next, but given the state of her bank account, decided it was probably time to enter into the world of work. After a few rounds of interviews and aptitude tests, she was offered a job as an Oracle DBA. She didn't actually know what that entailed, but after she'd looked it up, done some research and found out what it meant, she decided that actually it sounded like a good fit for her. It was a good plan. After all, her favorite topic in her maths degree had been group theory, and she'd really enjoyed learning about relational database design during her MSc. As she started to settle into her new role, she followed the courses and took the exams to get her Oracle 7 database administration certification. She spent her days calmly managing user accounts, getting sick of reorganizing table spaces to create contiguous blocks of free space that the database could use, reading white papers with titles such as how to stop defragmenting and start living and sometimes not so calmly trying to work out why on earth certain requests were running so slowly. She knew, because everyone around her said so, that Oracle databases were the best databases in the world, and she was very proud of her role. A few years later, she learned to manage Sybase and SQL Server databases and quickly came to the conclusion that she'd avoid them at all costs. Because, of course, who'd want to work with anything other than data Oracle databases? Instead, she celebrated each new version of Oracle by studying the new features and upgrading to the latest certification. She gradually stopped reorganizing her table space because Oracle kindly began to do it all by itself. She started to understand sometimes why certain requests were running so slowly and to let the developers know what they'd done wrong or force the Oracle optimizer to do better. She went to as many UK OUG conferences and special interest group meetings as possible to learn new things, to meet up with old colleagues and sometimes to present. She noticed over the years that the Oracle DBAs she met at the conferences were getting older, as she was, and unfortunately, the number of women wasn't increasing. During this time, she moved to the French Alps. She spent her weekends and holidays cycling, mountain biking, doing triathlons or skiing, depending on the season. She had two mostly adorable children, and she was particularly displeased when her daughters quickly became better than her at skiing, and shortly after that, after that at mountain biking. Once she reached 20 years of experience, she's told that she would now be known as a database expert, which made her feel a bit like a superhero, and she was even more proud, despite the fact it would have no impact on her role or her salary. By this point, she spent her days monitoring her databases, identifying performance issues, battling against poor security practices. No, you can't grant everything just in case. No, you can't hard code the passwords. No, you can't just copy the production data into the development databases. And delivering training courses and advice on best practices to the developers and other database users. One day, the project manager came to see her and delivered some life-changing news. We're going to start a completely new project, he started. Cool, replied our heroine, who, if we're being completely honest, was starting to get a bit bored. I'll start to prepare the spec for the Oracle. Not so fast, said the project manager. We're going to use Postgre databases. What? 
Postgre databases, repeated the project manager. We don't want to pay for any more Oracle licenses. We'll obviously need the same level of performance and high availability that we currently have with our Oracle databases. You'll need to set it up alongside the projects you're currently working on. Oh, and we don't yet have anyone in-house who knows how to do any of this. A dangerous mission full of adventure. Are you ready for it? Uh, yes, replied our expert in a very small voice. As soon as the project manager left, she hurried off in a panic to her favourite online retailer to buy herself a book and started to do some research to prepare for her journey into the world of this new and mysterious database. What's in a name? Always nice to get a bit of Shakespeare into a presentation. The first thing that she discovered, and she understood quickly that it was a very important point, was that it was not Postgre, but Postgres or PostgreSQL. She settled into a comfy chair to start reading her book, PostgreSQL 10 Administration Cookbook. Other reference books are available. But she really wanted to get going and she was too impatient to sit and read the whole thing. So she put it to one side as a reference. And instead quickly read through the page PostgreSQL for Oracle DBAs, which gave a really clear overview of the principal ideas in Postgres as compared with Oracle. She learned that there are lots of things that are similar between Oracle and PostgreSQL. So she wasn't completely lost and wasn't completely starting from scratch. There's the database composed of files. There's the instance, the memory and the processes that access the database. There are table spaces to organize the data files. And there's the config file to specify parameter values. Where there are redo logs in Oracle to track database modifications, there are write ahead logs or walls in Postgres. She can archive them in Postgres just as she can to, in Oracle to allow a point in time recovery of the database. There are schemas to group objects. She can issue a, an alter session set current schema in Oracle to avoid having to specify which schema queries should look in by default. And similarly, she can issue a set search path in Postgres. And since it's a relational database, she has all of the usual object, objects available to her. Tables, indexes, views, constraints. She discovered that PostgreSQL is extremely fast and easy to install. After all these years, she was used to Oracle installations and she was determined to be prepared. She therefore set aside an entire day and several gigabytes of disk for the Postgres installation. You can imagine her disappointment then when she discovered that once she'd configured the repository, all she needed to do was run yum install PostgreSQL 10 server. 10 at the time, obviously things have moved on a bit since then. And then it took less than a minute. She learned that it wasn't much more complicated to initialize her first cluster and create her first Postgres database. What on earth was she going to do with the remaining seven hours and 45 minutes of her day? She decided to document what she'd done so far and to start to learn how to do it all in Ansible that she'd only just come into contact with the first, for the first time. She discovered that there's a command line tool for old school DBAs who still like to write queries and execute scripts by hand. She learned how to connect to her database with PSQL and she spent several fun filled hours browsing through the information schema, tables and views and thinking about how she could modify some of her Oracle scripts from uh, SQL plus for Postgres PSQL. Everything went smoothly until it came to be time to exit PSQL. She typed exit, nothing. In capitals, no, quit. 
No. Quit in capitals? No. Q. Capital Q. Control C. Google. How do I exit PSQL? Oh, backslash Q. Of course. It made her extremely happy to learn that from version 11 onwards, it's possible to use quit or exit to exit PSQL. She discovered that a lot of tasks aren't performed natively by Postgres, but that there exists a multitude of tools to perform these tasks. For database monitoring and administration, for backup and restore, for replication and high availability, to generate activity on the database to perform benchmarks, and for analysis. The difficult bit is choosing which ones to use. She created some tables in a new database and noticed that Postgres uses lowercase by default for object names, whereas Oracle uses uppercase. She'd never like to see table and column names enclosed in double quotes in DDL scripts, but she'd never really been able to explain to her developers why this was a bad idea. Well, now she could justify that position. And the developers were apt to use upper and lowercase somewhat randomly. She decided to explain to them why this wasn't a good idea by using the same script to create a table and insert some data in Oracle and Postgres. If we try to create a table with three similarly named columns, so they're identical apart from the case, we'll get an error in either database because it thinks we're trying to create three identical columns. If we add quotes around the column names, each database will quite happily create the table and we have three different columns. But notice that the table name in Oracle is in capitals and the table name in Postgres is in lowercase. If we insert into a single column without enclosing the column name in double quotes, it doesn't matter which column we attempt to specify. So here I've specified Michael in lowercase. The data is always inserted into the second column, the uppercase column in Oracle, and in the first column, the lowercase column in Postgres. If we enclose the column name in double quotes, sorry, in um, in the with Oracle, it goes into. Apologise, I've uh, not gone on to the correct bit there. So if we enclose the column name in double quotes, it goes into the column that we've specified. So they're the one with mixed case. With each, each table, with each database, we can only access one of those columns without using double quotes around the column name. So in Oracle, it will always be the uppercase column name. And in Postgres, it'll always be the lowercase column name. She had to relearn some basic principles. She learned that the word role was equivalent to the word user in Postgres, and that the commands create user and create role were almost identical. She decided that in any case, she'd continue to the, use the word user to define an account that could connect to the database and the word role for a collection of privileges because she couldn't bring herself to let go of everything she knew just yet. She also learned that a schema and the owner of the object in a schema were two entirely different things. She decided to create a user with the schema name as her schema so she decided to create a user with the same name as her schema, because after all these years, she wasn't quite ready to accept this difference. She was also surprised to start with by the fact that she had to grant usage or create privileges on a schema in addition to privileges on the individual objects in it. Now here, I hope everybody appreciates my um, superior drawing skills. She discovered several shortcuts that made her life easier when granting privileges to users and roles in Postgres, such as granting privileges on all objects in a schema at the same time. In Oracle, she would have had to generate a script to do that. 
or granting privileges on objects that don't even exist yet. Or even granting the truncate privilege on a table. It might not sound like much, but this was a revelation. In Oracle, to truncate a table belonging to another user, the drop any table privilege is needed, which is a bit like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. She's seen various different workarounds for this, including application users with drop any table privileges, applications that connect using the schema owner account, huge deletes in place of truncates, or custom written truncate table procedures. Speaking of truncate, this is the script that she used to truncate several tables linked by foreign key constraints in Oracle. So first of all, it creates a script that will drop any foreign key constraints that reference the tables to be truncated, and a second script that will recreate those constraints. It executes the first script to drop the constraints, it truncates the tables, and then it executes the script to recreate the constraints. Ta-da! The Postgres version of the script is slightly shorter. She learned that the default values of some of the parameters in the PostgreSQL.conf aren't really designed for real world databases. The idea being to create a database that uses minimal resources by default. She found that just a few of those were shared buffers, the amount of memory the database server uses for shared memory buffers, where the default value is 128 meg, and uh, suggested values range from about 20 to 25% of your RAM up to a, a maximum of eight gigabytes. Work mem, the amount of memory used by internal sort operations and hash tables before writing to temporary disk files. Um, note that the total amount used by this could be many times this value because of parallel sorts or hash operations and concurrent sessions. So the default value for this is four megabytes and um, many people recommend a, a value of about 64 megabytes. And maintenance work mem, the maximum amount of memory used by maintenance operations such as vacuum, create index, alter table, add foreign key. Um, the default value of that is 64 megabytes and suggested values could be half a gig or a, a gigabyte. Obviously, um, those depend entirely on your system requirements. She discovered that unlike Oracle, Postgres is in auto commit mode. Each statement is by default a complete transaction ending in the commit. She could see this being really useful for those times when a developer set off several updates before going off for lunch or even on holiday without closing their session. On the other hand, it meant that she spent a lot of time reminding people that there's not really any point committing, or sorry, there's not really any point rolling back after the fifth delete if you didn't issue a begin before the first delete. It has to be said that she really missed rack. Several instances accessing a single database, high availability, uh, right scalability, transparent to the users, just like magic. To put in place a high availability architecture with read scalability for her Postgres databases, she learned to implement streaming regulation with RepMGR and monitoring with RepMGRD for automatic failover. There are many other methods to do this, but that would be a topic for another presentation as there wouldn't be time to cover all of that today. She was surprised to find toast in her database. She learned that these toast objects had nothing to do with grilled bread, but were to do with the oversized attribute storage technique. PostgreSQL doesn't allow uh, tuples to span multiple um, pages, typically 8K. Um, so it therefore breaks up any large field values into multiple chunks that are stored in associated toast tables. She also heard something about having to vacuum her tables. 
She learned that this was necessary because of the different approach to multi-version concurrency control or MVCC, uh, the handling of data updates and consistent reads used in Postgres compared to Oracle. In Oracle, a DML command will modify blocks in the buffer cache and the before values are stored in the undo segments, previously known as rollback segments. The, these dirty blocks in the buffer cache will be written to the data files later. So we could update line one. We'd have the updated line one in the buffer cache and we'd have an undo segment which had the original line one. If we delete line two, line two is removed from the block in the buffer cache and we have line two in the undo segment. If we now update line three, we have an updated version of line three in the buffer cache and we've added the original line three into the undo segment. Uh, note that this really is just a very simplified diagram to show the idea conceptually. This is not at all how the data is actually stored in the blocks. In Postgres, a row affected by an update will be duplicated within the table itself. The before version won't be physically deleted but will be marked as dead. So here, after update of line one, we've got two versions of line one, the original and the updated. If we delete di line two, it's still there, but marked as deleted. If we then update line three, we have the original and the updated version. To remove old rows that are no longer needed, the table needs to reclaim the space used by those vacuumed rows, we would have to do a vacuum fault. Again, this is very highly simplified and doesn't represent the actual way in which these, um, this information is stored within the pages. Fortunately, she discovered that auto vacuum is configured by default, which simplifies things. She left the defaults in place temporarily and made a note to look into the performance impact of the different auto vacuum parameters at a later date. She planned to partition her tables, but she was surprised to learn that there were a number of restrictions to partitioning that made this impractical in version 10. The plan was to partition her tables by region uh, to match the way in which the data was generally accessed by the applications. In Oracle, she would have done the following. Create a customer table partitioned by list on the region column. So she has one partition per region. Create a primary key and index on the partition table. So a primary key and index on my cust ID column. She would have then created an orders table with a foreign key to the customer table table, which was partitioned using reference partitioning. Each partition of the orders table would match a partition of the customers table. The orders table is effectively partitioned by region without needing to add the region column to the table. She could then create any required partitioned or non-partitioned indexes on the customer and the orders table. Partitioned indexes could be local whereby each index partition is effectively a mini index for the associated table partition or global, whereby the index can be partitioned using a, a different key, for example, order date. Unfortunately, partition tables have the following restrictions in Postgres 10. Indexes could only be created on each individual partition, not across the whole table. There was no automatic creation of an index for each partition, either existing or new in a table. It was necessary to create each um, the index for each partition individually. Unique constraints could only be enforced at the partition level, not the table level. So it isn't possible to create a unique index or primary key for the partition table. It wasn't possible to create a foreign key constraint to or from a partition table. So if I've got no foreign key constraint, I've got no reference partitioning either. Um, also an update that would move a, a row from one partition to another would fail. Rather than attempting to write some custom code as a workaround, she decided 
to leave her tables unpartitioned for now, hoping that the performance of her Postgres databases would mean that it wasn't necessary, and wait for new partitioning functionality to be introduced in future versions of Postgres. From version 11, a unique key or primary key can be created for the table, but it has to include all of the partition key columns. Otherwise, you'll get an error, insufficient columns in primary key. Uh, an index partition will be created automatically for each partition existing or new in the table. A foreign key constraint can be created from a partition table to a non-partition table. An update that causes a row to move from one partition to another will not fail. It will be implemented as a delete followed by an insert. And from version 12, a foreign key constraint can be created to a partition table. So most of the restrictions have now been removed. She thought she'd translate some of her PLSQL store procedures into PLPGSQL. She followed some examples and couldn't work out why she was getting errors in her Postgres 10 database. After doing some research, she discovered that stored procedures were introduced in version 11. So she really needed to upgrade her database, especially as she was a purist. She really didn't want to replace her procedures with functions because she still believed that functions shouldn't have side effects. The idea of creating a function that would cause a select to perform an insert, select my function, causes a row to be inserted into my table, gave her headaches. She realized that she knew the Oracle Data Dictionary, DBA, and Dynamic Performance, V$ views by heart, and that she really ought to get to know the tables and views in the PostgreSQL catalog and the information schema. She wanted to find out how much space was being used per schema, which privileges were granted to which users and roles, who executed what code, who was blocking who, how many active sessions there were, she already had scripts and queries that told her all of that in Oracle, and she needed to learn how to do it in Postgres. She spent a lot of time on Google searching for examples. She discovered that there was no dual table, that little Oracle table with just one line and one column dummy that can be used when returning the value of a function. And yes, it really upsets people and breaks things if we insert a second line into the table. But she learned that there was no need for it, that it's possible to issue a select without specifying a table. For example, where she'd issue select sysdate from dual in Oracle to find the current date. Ooh, excuse me. She could issue select now in Postgres. Something she already knew, but had never really stopped to think about too deeply, was the fact that Oracle didn't have a Boolean data type. There are a number of different workarounds, for example, using number one with values one and zero, or char one with y and n. But with Postgres, there's a true implementation. She discovered that many of her questions were answered really well by the PostgreSQL documentation, which she found well-written, well-maintained, easy to search, and easy to jump between the different versions to see what had changed. She also discovered, and is still discovering, many more similarities and differences, some big, some small, but there wasn't enough time to put them all into one presentation. There's the fact that there are no synonyms in Postgres. She discovered that messages written to the PostgreSQL log contain really useful text, but no error code, although that behavior can be changed in the log file um, by adding percent %e to the log line prefix. Um, there are no query optimizer hints 
in Postgres. Um, there's no V$ long ops to see how long an operation might take. She discovered PG days, PG confs, meetups, Twitter feeds, blogs, and mailing lists full of useful information and new contacts. Just a few examples of the sites that she found. She discovered that the PostgreSQL community was full of welcoming, friendly people with a lot of knowledge that they really like to share. And after a couple of years, she still felt as though her Postgres adventure was only just beginning. Each day brought new topics to research, new things to learn, new things to analyze and put in place. And she also found herself revisiting and reevaluating some of the Oracle and general database topics that she thought she knew by heart. Uh, null, for example, transaction isolation. And she was enjoying her PostgreSQL adventure so much that she decided to abandon her Oracle roots entirely and become a senior database consultant with Enterprise DB. The end or the end of the beginning of a new adventure. Thank you very much. Hi there. This brings us to the question and answer portion of our, of our session. And I'm really happy to hear Karen's story about how she transitioned from being an Oracle DBA to being a Postgres DBA or more importantly, a Postgres consultant. And my name is Bhavani Rao. I'm moderating a few questions and I'm happy to say that there's so many questions, very good questions. So I'm gonna start off with the very first one, which is asked by Chris. He asked a very good question, which is uh, the, it, basically the question is with so many extensions that are available, how do you determine uh, which extensions you can use based on you know the fact that there's no single provider like Oracle to validate and verify these are worthy of using in production? That's a really good question. And yes, there are a lot of different vendors and that's one of the positives of Postgres is that there are so many people con contributing to the project. Um, I would say that the way I've decided um, whether extensions are useful and um, trustworthy is by talking to other members of the Postgres community, um, by, by seeing which extensions other people use and which companies other people consider to be reliable. Great. Here's another question from Chris as well. Another good question, which is, does Postgres SQL have a similar mechanism as Oracle where security patches are released quarterly or are security practice released with minor and major releases only? That's pretty obvious, Lee can explain that. So the, the security um, updates are included in the minor releases of Postgres and the, the minor releases of Postgres, we recommend that you, you keep up to date with those. Um, there shouldn't be risk to, um, to applying those, it should only bring positives. And I believe that the that every quarter that there's a security update is that from the Postgres SQL community. So that's the normal okay. cadence as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got a question here from Karthik. It says, uh, does Enterprise DB provide an out of the box solution for data encryption at rest? <laughs> So for data encryption at rest, I assume we're thinking of something like the equivalent to Oracle's trans, uh, transparent data encryption. Um, and for that, um, EDB actually partner with um, Fails uh, Vormetric to provide that function. Correct. the TD operate, offering we do, we have, but it's not out of the box with, uh, with our product. 
And then I've got a question here from Jan who says, hi, in Oracle, I can simply check creation date by select DBA underscore objects. Is there a simple way in Postgres SQL? Uh, so the short, short answer is that no, there isn't a simple way, um, but there are ways to find that information um, by querying the information um, in the system views. And um, that's the kind of thing where most DBAs would have their own scripts um, pre-prepared to, uh, to get that kind of information out for them. And there are also quite a lot, um, even if you just do Google searches, there are a lot of people that have already come up with that kind of, uh, that kind of query. Another question that's related to Postgres SQL 12, version 12 from Jan, is there a doc with new features on version 12? Uh, yes, so the um, new features of each version are, are published in a document. If you go to the postgresql.org website, you should be able to find those. And in fact, um, I think at the same time as this talk, Magnus was actually talking about the new features of version 13. So when that talk's available on, uh, on demand, I'd recommend having a look at that as well. And, and just to add to Karen, what Karen says, not only is the information on Postgres 12 release notes on postgres.org, but I believe that the beta release notes or something to that effect are also posted on postgres.org. So you yeah. can see the improvements to B-tree indexes and so forth. Thanks, Karen. Okay, another question from Chris. How do you find the Postgres SQL optimizer compares with the Oracle optimizer when it, came, when it comes to choosing efficient and stable execution plans for SQL queries, have you attempted to use extension offerings such as PG hints underscore plan? Have you used any specific parameters such as substitute for hints? If so, which ones? Good question. So, yeah, this is a good question. Um, so far, I've, um, I've been a lot involved a lot with the um, the architecture side of setting up Postgres and less with the actual um, performance tests and optimization. So I perhaps don't have as much oversight of that as um, other people might. Um, but I know from my experience so far and from what I hear from other people in the field that it seems to compare very well. And the idea is that in general, the optimizer hints aren't required, um, but I'm sure that everybody has their own experiences on that. So no, I haven't um, tried using those extensions. Okay. I got a question here from Glenn and he asked uh, something I was gonna put in if nobody asked. And that was, if you're a DBA, what is your biggest stumbling block before jumping into Postgres SQL from Oracle? Um, before jumping, I think it's the, the Oracle bubble that um, I think I said at the beginning of the presentation that Oracle DBAs know that Oracle is the best database. Why would we want to, why would we want to try anything else? So I think it's mindset. I think once you get out of that mindset of it's Oracle or nothing, um, I think um, certainly the DBAs I've known are open to, to learning. They're, um, they're quite capable of moving into Postgres, but I think it's, it really is that wanting to do it, wanting to learn um, a new database technology. Great. Okay, we got now a question from Sandeep, and I hope I'm reading this correctly. Question is, what are the performance analysis reports like AWR reports in Oracle? I'm assuming he's looking for comparison with PostgreSQL. Um, yeah, so there, um, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the extension right now. Um, I might have to come back to that, but um, that's another of those things where um, natively you don't, automatically get an AWR type report, um, but there is um, a SQL profiler um, um, extension, for example, that can, um, that can give you a lot of information. And I'm sure there Great. are many more. Okay. As well. we, we've got so many questions, we can keep going. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we got Bosker who's asking, does PostgreSQL have a feature like always on from SQL Server? Um, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, my knowledge of SQL Server has almost completely left me, so I, um, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the comparison is there. Fair enough. Um, okay, let's move on to a question from Simon, who's asking, can you set up SSL connections out of the box with EDB, or you know, what the, what's the process to create an SSL connection? Uh, yes, um, you can. You um, you just need to set those uh, the parameters required, and um, you would need to have your um, certificates in place. And then the uh, next question is from Ping Zhang, who says, is there an OEM equivalent tool that allows you to drill down into the details and SQL execution as well as other parts of a running database instance? So, um, I yes, think he's talking, the, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so there is the, the community tool PG admin and um, EDB have Postgres Enterprise Manager which um, provides quite a lot of the, the same functionality as uh, OEM Oracle Enterprise Manager. Sorry, Bhavani, I think you had something I, I to think, say on this one. Yeah, yeah, I just wanna add on is that I believe that you can expand into the explain uh, statements or use explain to get more information on that through both PG admin as well as through the, the tool that uh, Enterprise DB produces. So if, if I'm incorrect, let me know. <laughs> Next question is uh, from Singa Ravelan, and he says, what is the best backup tool for large scale data warehouse Postgres databases with point PITR? Um, okay, so um, EDB have um, a backup tool called backup and, backup and recovery tool BART. So I, I don't think it's necessarily a case of saying which is the best backup tool. Um, there, are, there are various different tools available. There is PG Backrest that's very well respected. Um, there's Barman. Um, so there are, there are different tools available, um, all of which have um, similar functionality, but some excel in certain areas, some have particular functionality. Um, I'll try and find the details, but I am um, someone much more knowledgeable than me on uh, on backup tools actually um, did a talk um, at CERN in January on the, the functionality of the various different backup tools available. And that was very interesting. So I'm afraid it's one of those questions um, that has the answer, it depends. <laughs> well said, okay. I'm trying to get through all the questions. There's so many. Another one from Chris. Does Postgres SQL have SQL tuning, SQL tuning features similar to SQL plan baselines, SQL profiles, and outlines in Oracle? Or do you find that Postgres SQL discourages the use of, of more, or, more of these than Oracle does? Um, so I, I think those are very specific Oracle um, bits of functionality. Uh, and I'm not aware of the use of anything like that in Postgres. Under acknowledged. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, I'll be very happy to see, be corrected. Let me see. Okay. Okay, here's another question. This is a good one. Is that, uh, hi, any thoughts about Postgres SQL horizontal scalability solutions, <laughs> multi-node processing? This is a loaded question, so. Take it is time. a loaded question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have lots of thoughts on that. Um, and as I said in my presentation, I loved Rack. Rack was, Rack was brilliant, um, but I wasn't paying for it. Um, I think that um, for most people, the horizontal scalability that you can get with um, adding read replicas is is sufficient from what I've seen, from what I've heard people say, for most shops, um, setting up PostgreSQL streaming replication and sharing your read load across those replicas 
is is sufficient. There are other solutions. Um, there are solutions available for people that want to do a uh, true multi-master, but I think that the, the cases where that's actually necessary are probably quite few and far between. That's a, a topic for a, a, another presentation because that really is a, a very loaded question. In fact, in, in, I'll add to that, there is a replication session tomorrow and you can, we can, uh, that's being presented by John Dalton. I'd recommend that you attend that. But as Karen was saying, logical replication comes out of the box with Postgres SQL and it's sufficient for most use cases is what most people are, are using right now. So uh, I'm sorry, physical replication comes out of the box uh, with S Postgres SQL and it's what most people are using to this day or physical or streaming replication. Uh, we have a one detailed question here from Shiv, which is, do we have a feature similar to materialize view in Postgres SQL? So I haven't actually used materialized views in Postgres SQL, but I believe that they do exist. Um, I would be very happy to be corrected if that's uh, not the case. Okay, next question is, if you're planning to move from Oracle to Postgres over the next couple of months, would be better, better to wait until the Postgres 13 uh, is GA uh, and, or should we go ahead and take the beta as it is right now and go from there? What's your su suggestion on, uh, because of the fact that Postgres SQL 13 is pending in the next few months? Wow, that's another very loaded question. Uh, and another that could very easily be answered with, it depends. Um, it depends where you're up to in your uh, in the cycle of your migration, um, how risk averse your organization is, for example. Um, there are, um, from reading the release notes uh, for the beta version, I believe there are a lot of um, small enhancements in Postgres 13 um, rather than um, rather than big ones. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes to be on the latest version to take advantage of the latest features. So I think personally, if I was planning a migration at the moment, I would try the Postgres 13 beta and do some pocs on that. And then by the time you're actually ready to do a full on migration, I suspect that the, uh, the full version of Postgres 13 would be ready. But it's a, a very personal, okay. uh, personal decision. I totally concur. And having said that, we have exceeded the time that uh, we've been <laughs> allocated. I want to respect everyone's time. I'm, I know everyone enjoyed it. We want to thank you for attending and please enjoy the rest of Postgres Vision. Uh, thank you That's for your I questions. Have. I appreciate that.